induce flowing of the stem cells. So, uh, so you have to follow a timeline, whatever I showed you. I mean, maybe uh, people have also a kind of a knack to devise the protocols. So nowadays people have reduced the timeline to eight to 10 days, but ideally in the, the, in the timeline, whether it's a, it's a short timeline or maybe it's a long timeline, you have to follow uh, repetitive transcription regimen because you are using an mRNA molecule. Right? Because repetitive transcription regimen is very important to sustain the high level expression of the protein. Number two, once you will generate the iPSCs, then suppose you started with a million of cells and then you might end up with like, I mean, 40, 50, or maybe 100 clones. But you cannot be called that clone. So for that, you need to um, gaze them morphologically. And then you can do a live staining by using the RA H1 stringent marker. So on the basis of morphology and stringent markers, you can actually pick um, bona fide IPS clones. So once you will identify or you will identify the subset of the clones, you can take those clones from a culture. Maybe you can cut them into pieces or maybe in the fragments so that you have to propagate these clones as well. So you have to keep each clone in a separate culture dish, right? So suppose you have 10 colonies, so you can pick one colony, so you can cut the fragments. Suppose there's a one colony, huge colony is there. You can cut them into 10 fragments, like let me show you any colony here so that you will understand what I'm saying. Um, suppose this is the huge colony here. And then this is what you got. Uh, after the reprogramming, maybe this will be better. Uh, was no so suppose you, you got here a lot of colonies you can see after the reprogramming. So you have to gaze them morphologically and then you have to strain them with the TRA181 stringent markers. Suppose you end up with maybe a 12 or 13 or maybe 20 subsets of the clone. So you have to pick each clone mechanically first thing. But before picking, you have to cut these clones into a small fragment and you have to transfer each clone, maybe the fragments of each clone into a separate culture dish because the idea is to propagate each clones as well. So once you will propagate, then you can make some stocks as well and then you will get, eventually you will get a cell line for the IPS cell lines. Now, once you will get the IPS cell lines, what you have to do, you have to, Characterize them at the mRNA level, at the protein level. So at mRNA level, you have to uh, use certain stringent markers, and then you can run the gel to see the expression of those markers like Arpun, Yanov, Taylor Force, Roxxu, etc. And then you have to do immunofluorescence studies as well to see whether the gene expression is actually like translated in those proteins as well or not. So you can do some immunofluorescence studies. So these are the initial, um, I would say, uh, stages of the characterization, but it's not going to tell you that whether you got a bona fide IPC or not, for that we have to perform functional assays. So yesterday we discussed about the functional assays as well. Those functional assays were like um, in vitro transplantation, in vitro transplantation, separate complementation assays, and the primary assays. So these functional assays are very, very important because you have to assess the fluid proteins the characterization at the mRNA level and then maybe at the protein level, um, it's suggesting that you've got cells which are very much similar to the IPS cells, but it doesn't say that you got a bona fide IPS cells. But to check, to assess the protein potency, you have to perform these functional studies. Then we discuss about the in vivo and in vitro differentiation. So in, in vivo differentiation, the idea was very simple. You can take the cells, you can make a single cell suspension of your uh, cells, then you have to add the metagen, and then you have to infect these cells back into a skip mice or the immunocompromised mice. So why we are using immunocompromised mice? Because the cells which you are using are human origin. And the cells which you are going to inject in a species is the mice. So both are of different, uh, both are different species. So if you will add these cells in a normal mice, then what will happen, then there is every chance of the immune rejection. So to eliminate that probability, what you can do, you can simply 
you will ask it might that is your immune compromised mice then you have to inject t cells in cascade mice and after four to five weeks if you see the teratomas then you have to isolate the teratomas you have to do the sanctioning if you see all the three terms here that is ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm then you can say that um, your cells are pretty much bona fide ips cells but it doesn't mean that you have to perform all the function assays I mean, so if you are getting a teratomas I guess that would be sufficient, but if you have more money, if you have more resources to spend, then you can go for the chimeras as well as the tetrapod complementation assays. Um, then the one other functional assays was in vitro representation assays, so you have to uh, culture your cells in a suspension. You have to withdraw all the factors which are keeping your cells in a non differentiated state. Like in case of human FGF is very important, pterygium is very important. If you will withdraw these uh, these factors, and you will also withdraw the substrate, and if you will put these cells in a um, ultra low attachment dishes in a suspension culture, then it will lead uh, it will uh, start differentiating, and they will form a lymphoid body. So lymphoid bodies are nothing; they are like the of the stem cell itself, right? So they will try to recapture the embryonic development. So if you see that there is a formation of the embryonic bodies, again you can do a sectioning and you can um, uh, go for some uh, immunohistochemistry and then you can look for your all three germ scale, equidum, mesoderm, and endoderm. Chimera formation, again, uh, this is the gold standard assay, but the problem is that you cannot, you cannot perform this in the humans, but you have to use the mice for that. And then at the end of the day, uh, by definition, um, during the instances are undifferentiated cells. So under certain physiological or experimental conditions, you can induce them to become a cell in a very specialized position. So if the mandate of your lab is that you need to form a beta cell or maybe a cardiac cell, so you can try to navigate your cells towards those, those lineages. If your cells are bona fide IPS cells, then you would be able to get those cells. Now, having said all these things, so if I have to summarize IPS cells, I would say they are people. People means productive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And the most important attribute, the most important advantage of having the IPS cells would be that you can use them for the automated cell therapy. That means you can take a cell from the patient. You can generate the IPS cells, or maybe you can induce the pluripotency in the somatic cells, and then you can navigate these cells toward the kind of cells you know, which is being required from the patient. So, both the patient is suffering from a myocardial infarction, then you can generate the cardiac cells from the surface cells. If somebody is suffering from Alzheimer's, then you can form a neuronal cell from the somatic cells just by inducing the pluripotency. So, uh, there are certain advantages which are associated with the IPS cells. So as I said, that uh, by using a non-integrative approach, um, you can generate a clinical grade IPS cells. Now, what is the issue? Can we use directly these cells for therapy? Can we directly inject these cells in the patient? Uh, I would say no. Because uh, the, the point is, when you culture them in a, in, in a, in a culture system, what you do, you will generate the IPS cells, you will navigate them towards any lineage which you are looking for, suppose cardiac cells. Now, you got the cardiac cells in your hand, but you wouldn't know that all the cells which you have differentiated are completely differentiated. There might be a possibility that you might end up with one or two. <clears throat> Hello? My voice is not clear. Hello? Am I audible to everyone? Yes, Hello? sir. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Please not able to hear me clearly, I guess. Maybe the problem is it's with I don't know. So maybe sir, if you are having a problem, then you can check your audio, I guess. That's what I can do because I, I believe that uh, from my side, I guess there's no issues. Anyway, so now it's clear. Let me see again. 
ओके दीन दयाल मिश्रा ओके दीन दयाल नाउ माय वॉइस इज क्लियर दे आर स्टिल वेज अ प्रॉब्लम हेलो हेलो यस सर योर वॉइस इज ब्रेकिंग द वॉइस इज ब्रेकिंग नो सर देयर इज लिटिल बिट या लिटिल बिट हिंड्रेंस Maybe it's from your side, I guess. So I mean, because I'm not using Wi-Fi, I'm using this cord actually. So maybe you're using Wi-Fi. That's why. Maybe there's a problem with the speed, I guess. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I am using Wi-Fi. Yeah, maybe that's the problem, I guess. But just try to. Be, I'm going slow anyway. So if you have any issues, any questions, you just just you can uh, write it down or or you can just send a message to me. So I will try to address that question. Right. I will try to go slow. Yes, sir. So, um, if you will think that IPSC is definitely IPSC is have a lot of advantages uh, over the non-ink sensors, like I mean, no ethical issues are there, and then they definitely they are coming from the patient itself. The chances of having a new death rejection will be nil. So once you will get this IPSC or maybe a test right from the IPSC, can we use directly? For for this this uh, for the therapy, so my answer would be no, because if you will transfer the undifferentiated IPSs back into the patient directly, maybe in the heart if you will inject the IPSs, so within the heart they will get the environment of the cardiac cells, so they will start differentiating the cardiac cells. But if there will be a small population of the cells which will remain undifferentiated, then what will happen? If you will go to this this um, with the definition, so they are undifferentiated cells, and then they, they can give us all type of cells. Means even a single undifferentiated cells have the potential to give rise to a teratomas. So they can induce a tumor in the patient itself. So, what is the remedy? So for that we have to develop a very stringent protocol. What kind of protocol we have to develop? So we can do one thing: just break the cardiac cells. I'm just giving an example from that case, and then prolong the culture of the cardiac cells. Try to prolong it so that you can eliminate the chances of having even a single undifferentiated cell in your culture system. But how much viable it would be? I'm not sure because prolong means maybe you will compromise the viability of, of uh, the cardiac cells as well. So that's why you have to develop a very stringent and very safe protocol before supplying these cells back into the patient. That's that's very important. Maybe this is a stumbling block, uh, um, which goes against this IPSC as far as therapy is concerned, right? So uh, technically, you can generate the IPSCs from any patient, regardless of the age. You can generate the cells from the IPSCs. Whatever the patient uh, is required, but at the end of the day, you have to make this technology more safe. And the people are working in this area, and I guess most likely, if in coming days, in coming years, you will see more safe protocols, more stringent protocols, so that people can use it uh, for the therapy. <laughs> Now. When we think about this pluripotent stem cell, we started our journey from the synchronic stem cells, right? In way back in 1981, uh, Sir Martin Evans he discovered the synchronic stem cells. He formulated the culture conditions, uh, which was congenial to to culture the synchronic stem cells. Way back in 1981. So he used a very, he used a very specific strain of the uh, mice in those days to generate these mouse synchronic stem cells. Now. In 2007, people um, Yamanaka, what he did actually, he was able to generate the IPSC that is induced pluripotent stem cells from the somatic cells. So it's about the mouse and the human. What about the other species, like other strains of the mice? What about the rat? What about the livestock, like sheep, goat? Just name any mammals. So people in 1981, actually, like especially uh, Mr. Sir Martin Evans, actually. He generated the embryonic stem cells from a very specific strain in the mice. Then people thought maybe it would be easy to translate all these uh, this technology to other species as well. 
But you will be surprised that for the generation of the rat embryonic stem cells, it took almost, uh, I guess, um, 20 or maybe a 25 odd years, 24 years, just to discover the embryonic stem just to establish the rat embryonic stem cells. Means, it, it means that whatever the condition, the culture conditions people were using to culture the mouse embryonic stem cells were not optimum for the rat embryonic stem cells. And then think about the other lines, like what about the cattle embryonic stem cells, buffalo embryonic stem cells, goat embryonic stem cells, and the other lines. So you will be surprised to know that nobody so far has been able to generate a bona fide livestock embryonic stem cells. So it means we have to improve our understanding of the pluripotency. So in the different species, Maybe there are different windows at which we have to capture the pluripotency. So I will give you an example of rat. You can see here that rat, and then you can see the livestock. So uh, we have to improve our understanding of the pluripotency. So for the generation of the rat in the stem cells, it took almost 24 years since the generation of the uh, mice in the stem cells way back in 1980. So how they generated this rat embryonic stem cells? You, some of you might be working on the rat uh, um, as a model for some TB for um, some diseases or whatever. But when you compare the mice and the rat, both look very similar. But think about the embryonic stem cells. The moment you think about the embryonic stem cells, you, you will be surprised that the culture condition which being used to generate the rat embryonic stem cells is very different from the mouse embryonic stem cells. So there was a group in the UK, I mean, the Austin uh, Simmons group actually. What they did actually, they came up with a new culture system to generate the rat embryonic stem cells. So uh, that system, they designated that system as a 3 i emulator. So the 3 i medium. What is that 3 i medium? So it was basically developed by the Austin Smith group and, and the culture medium was fully chemically defined. It means they were not using the serum at all in, in that culture system. Instead of a serum, they were using a n 2 bt So it's a different formulation altogether. So if you compare this system with a, a mouse embryonic stem cell culture system, in case of a mouse, definitely people use serum because the best proxy for the, the cheap proxy for the BNP. But in case of this formulation, there was no serum at all. So uh, that's why it was a kind of defined medium. So what they did actually, they used three inhibitors in the system. So the, these three inhibitors were like, I mean, um, if you will see, um, MEK inhibitor, GSK3 inhibitor, and FGF4 receptor inhibitors. So by using these molecules, they were able to generate the rat embryonic stem cells. That's very important. So if you will compare this with the mice embryonic or mouse embryonic stem cells, the culture system is very, very different. It means this culture system is species specific. If you have the culture of the goat embryonic stem cells, maybe the culture condition needs to be different. If you want to culture uh, uh, maybe a uh, um, bovine actually, uh, embryonic stem cells, so maybe the culture system would be different. So what they did was the Austin Smith did actually he used uh, the three inhibitors or three I medium to generate uh, this uh, um, rat embryonic stem cells. And how he did it? So he used the combination of MEK inhibitor, FGFR receptor inhibitor, and GSK3 inhibitor. So this allowed him to maintain the pluripotency of the rat embryonic stem cells. So he published this paper in the cell way back in um, 2000, I guess, uh, um, maybe um, seven or eight, I guess. So anyway, so uh, the point is that all these systems, you cannot mimic, you cannot mimic the culture systems, um, like if you are trying to uh, generate the goat embryonic stem cell, you cannot use the mouse culture system uh, to generate the goat embryonic stem cell. 
So it means these culture systems are species specific. So if you will see here, so this is the picture, or uh, this is the uh, uh, picture which is coming directly from this uh, cell paper. So I wanted to show you this red PS colony. So you can see this colony. So if you will compare these colonies with like the mouse one, they, they look a bit, uh, similar to the mouse one. They also grow in the form of discrete colonies. So they have a high nucleocytoplasmic ratio. And if you will see that A panel, which means on the left side, the cells are very much undifferentiated. And the moment you will withdraw all the inhibitors, they will start differentiating. You will see these are the differentiating cells. And the moment they will differentiate, there will be a down regulation of the output in the network. These are the very stringent filters. So it means without inhibitor, it's very difficult for the right ear cells to remain in an undifferentiated state. So how these inhibitors are working, let me try to understand. So what I said, they use three inhibitors. One is, if you will see here, actually, these two inhibitors, SU5402, PD184352, both are working upstream of the phosphine RK part. And while if you will see on the right side, leukemia and inhibitory factor works downstream of the phosphine RK part. So it means, it means that you, in a rat embryonic stem cell culture system, you don't have to use the leukemia inhibitory factor because you are using some molecules or certain molecules which are acting upstream of the phosphate ERP part. So if you will block the ERP signaling, lift can largely be replaced by the partial inhibitor or inhibition of the glycogen synthase kinase, which is actually what? It acts principally by stabilizing the intracellular beta So it means by using these systems, like, I mean, if you can use three, these, these biomolecules, what you can do, you can generate the rat embryonic senses, but this medium, the system is very, very different from the mouse embryonic senses system. So if you want to um, see how this, this bovine or maybe the buffalo embryonic stem cell system works. So with these two are inhibitors, so because they, they, they act upstream of the phosphory RK pathway, while uh, when you add lift, they attack downstream of the phosphory RK pathway. So if you can use these two inhibitors to generate this bovine, and people have tried to generate to use the same culture system for this other livestock. They, they, they got some colonies, but they were not able to maintain these colonies beyond three to four facades. You can see these are bovine and tonic cells coming from the ICN cells, but they were not able to maintain by using this, this uh, three inhibitors. It means what? It means this avenue is very much open. When the livestock people are still trying to formulate a medium which can be used to maintain the livestock in one expense in an undifferentiated state. So in case of a mouse, you are using a serum. In case of a rat, you are not using a serum. In case of a human, you are also not using a serum. In case of a human, you we were using the FGM, the fibroblast growth factor. But in case of a mouse, we were using the leukemia inhibitor factor. And in case of a rat, you are using no three system that is a three inhibitor for the three biomolecules. So people have realized that embryonic stem cell commitment is triggered by the mitogen activated protein kinase that is a ERKK. Now, the moment they realize that embryonic cell commitment, embryonic stem cell commitment is triggered by the mitogen activated protein kinase that is a ERKK, they allowed them to replace the serum with a selected small molecule inhibitors. So then this is a very important point. But apart from that, you can also add the leukemia inhibitor factor when you're touching the rat embryonic senses because it will improve the cholinogenicity of your cells. So the bottom line is the culture system is species specific. 
right? You cannot mimic the same system. If you have developed some system for one species, you cannot, you cannot use the same system for another species because signaling pathways may be a very different uh, in, among the species to maintain these cells in an undifferentiated state. Now, the point is that from where the symbionic stem cells are coming, the embryonic stem cells are coming from the blastocysts, right? So if you remember my first lecture, uh, we were talking about the same with the fertilized embryos. So you have the embryos or the surface embryos in the with fertilization lab. You can get from um, those those embryonic uh, or those of embryos, and then you can try to isolate the ICM cells, and then you will try to capture the embryonic stem cells from life and from those ICM cells. Now, if you will see closely, that the first differentiation of the blastocyst, uh, the first differentiation takes place at blastocyst stage, which means um, you will get two types of cells at the blastocyst stage. One is the factor cells, another one is ICM cells. And if you will see this, this uh, ICM cells, ICM cells have a subset of the cells. Like the number of the ICM cells you can expect in a blastocyst like 120, 125 cells only, depending on the quality of the blastocyst. So we grade blastocysts in the different category. So maybe the best quality of the blastocyst will have almost 120 to 130 um, ICM cells. Now the ICM cells have a subset of the cells. You can see they have the epiblast and they have the hyperblast. Now the epiblast is actually giving rise to the ectodermis and the so when we say that ICM cells are pluripotent in nature, they can give rise to all types of the cells. So it's not the ICM cells, there are subpopulation of uh, the cells which are known as epiblast cells are there uh, within the ICM, which give rise to the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Now it's an in vivo situation. There was uh, once uh, this is uh, after the post implantation, you will see this epiglass radio So, there is a concept. What I'm trying to tell you, there is a concept actually. Is a concept of the ground state night pluripotency. So, let me show you this figure, then you will understand what I'm saying. So, you can see these two figures. So this is the mouse embryo, or the representation of a mouse embryo. That's a 4.5 day old embryo. Now, this is the pre-implantation stage embryo. This is the post-implantation stage embryo. So see the difference. Pre-implantation stage embryo is like before the implantation, and this is the post-implantation stage embryo. These are the two phases of the pluripotence. I'm trying to make you understand what it means. So one is a ground state, another uh, maybe the night state, another one is a primary state. So the ground state night pluripotency is established in the epiblast of the mature blastocyst. So if you remember in the blastocyst, what I said that you have the ICM cells and there is a subset of the cells within the ICM cells which are known as epiblast. So eventually the epiblast gives rise to the ectoderm, mesoderm, and now what I said, this ground state naive pluripotency established in the epiblast of a mature blastocyst. And if you want to capture them in vitro, then you can capture in the form of a embryonic stem cell. It means source of the embryonic stem cells are the epiblast. And this is coming from here, from the pre-implantation stage. After implantation, you see what happens. So after implantation, so the epiblast, what happened with the epiblast? They transformed into a cup-shaped epithelium. You see, so the epiblast. Now after the implantation, so this is a post-implantation stage. After the implantation, your epiblast transformed into the cup-shaped epithelium. And it becomes primed for the linear specification and commitment in response to still life on the extra embryonic tissue that is the fetal. So, if you want to capture 
the embryonic stem cell from this stage, you won't be able to capture the embryonic stem. What you will end up? You will end up with this epiblast. So see the difference. If you are capturing the epiblast from the pre-implantation stage in view, what we are getting, we are ending up with the embryonic stem cells in the in between. But if you are using a post-implantation stage in view, when you are trying to isolate this epiblast, then what's happening here? You are ending up with the epiblast. It means epiblast stem cells are the in vitro counterpart of the primed epiblast. So what I said, there are two phases of fluid potency. One is a ground state, high fluid potency, and one is a prime state. So this is an example of a mouse blastosis. So if you will try to capture the embryonic stem cells, what you can do, you can take a pre-implantation stage in view. You can isolate the stem cells and you can capture the embryonic stem cells in an in vitro condition. Because if you remember, ICM cells have a subset of the cells which is known as epiblast. And epiblast will be less to the measure and render. It means these epiblast cells are, these embryonic stem cells are very potent in nature and they can be the small type of cells. The moment you just get implanted in living cells, your epiblast transformed into the cup shaped epiblast. Now, if you will try to capture this cup shaped epithelium in inventory conditions, what will happen? You will end up with a epiblast. It means epiblast tenses are the in vitro counterpart of the prime epiblast. This is very, very important. So, it means shortly after the implantation, epiblast is transformed into the cup shaped epithelium and it becomes prime for the previous specification and commitment in response to the perpetual. Now, what you will see here, this is your embryonic stem cells, this is your epiblast stem cells. Now, if you want to convert the embryonic stem cells to the epiblast stem cells, you can easily convert or differentiate them into the epiblast stem cells just by the activation of um, or maybe exposure to the active and KL. Right? And if you want to convert the epiblast stem cells into the embryonic stem cells, what you can do? You can just transmit these cells with a KLO4. And by the topic expression of the KLO4, you can convert the epiblast stem cells in embryonic stem cells. So, pre implantation stage embryo is your down state, newly um, potency state, while from the post implantation stage embryo, what you're getting, you're getting a prime state of the epiblast. So, these are the two phases of the newly potency. So this is the real pictures you can see in vivo, like that's how it looks, your, your uh, mouse blastosis. So this is the ground state epiblast and after implantation, you can see your epiblast is transformed into, into a cup shaped epiblast. So what you can see this white asterisk, you can see this white asterisk here, this is indicating the epiblast. So it's converted into a, transformed into the cup shaped epithelium, right? So this, and you have to see that the, so there was in the ICM cell, there was a subset of two cells. One was epiblast and another one was hypoblast. So the layer of the hypoblast, which is underlying the epiblast in the blastocells, and the proamniotic cavity surrounded by the epiblast in the post implantation embryo, this is your hypoblast. So if you will see here, the hypoblast is displaced downward after the implantation. You can see here it got displaced downward toward the um, uh, after the implantation. Why it got uh, downward or displaced downward after the implantation? To the proliferation of the trophectoderm. So trophectoderm drive vector, extra embryonic ectoderm. What they do? They will proliferate. And then there will be a constraint on the uterine wall. The moment there will be a constraint on the uterine wall, what will happen? The epiblast will be displaced downward toward the after the implantation. So if you would like to capture the embryonic stem cells, you can capture from the pre-implantation stage also. So you will end up here. What is the embryonic stem cells? But if you will use a post-implantation stage embryo, what you will get? You will get the epiblast stem cells. Now, epi 
blast filter can be converted into a hydronic synthesis. Hydronic synthesis can be converted into a heavy blast filter. So if I can see, if, if I have to say, I can see that these epic blast stem cells are to some extent more differentiated from a hydronic cell. This is very important. Now think about the mouse hydronic stem cells and the human hydronic stem cells. So both look different. Like mouse hydronic stem cells are very dome shaped and then the culture conditions are very different. So Okay, here in this case, mouse embryonic stem cells are different from the human embryonic stem cells, but mouse epiblast stem cells are similar to the human epiblast. This is a very important point that the mouse embryonic stem cells are similar to what? The human, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's different from the human embryonic stem cells, while the mouse epiblast stem cells are similar to the human epiblast, human embryonic stem cells. So, Instead of using the word human embryonic stem cells, we can also use the term human epiblast. It means what? It means that we are not able to capture the bona fide embryonic stem cells from pre implantation human or pre implantation stage human embryos. So if you are isolating the ICM cell, from the blastocyst of the from the human blastocyst B5 analysis, and you believe that you will capture the embryonic sensors, um, then you will, then it means uh, uh, that your expectations are wrong because from the human embryonic uh, from the human blastocyst, if you will capture if you isolate the ICM cells, you will end up with a human epiblast sensors. It means you can easily compare the mouse epiglass stem cells with the human embryonic stem cells. However, I feel the designation is wrong. So, human embryonic stem cells should be designated as a human epiglass stem cells. Now, what is the difference in the human embryonic stem cells and on maybe the epiglass stem cells? So, you can see the first difference is the sources. Like in one case, you are getting from the pre implantation stage embryo, and another case, you are getting from the post implantation. However, in case of a human, we are using the pre implantation stage embryo, but you are ending up here, you are ending up with the epiblast stem cells. Now, epiblast stem cells are the in vitro counterpart of this prime epi. This is very important. So, if you will see the difference, I feel, so pretty much both are same except one thing. And what is that difference? The difference is that if you will if you will add actually i mean if, if you will take a blastocyst and you will inject your epiblaster epiblast stem cells in a blastocyst they are not going to if you will see this thing they're not capable of functional colonization of the post blastocyst it means if you have the epiblast stem cells you cannot get the chimeras and if you go back to the functional assays, chimeras are the gold standard assays for the, to assess the pluripotency. That's a very important point. Now, having said all these things, how you will differentiate or distinguish between the embryonic stem cells and the epiglass stem cells? The, the important epigenetic distinction between the epiblastums and embryonic stem cells is the presence of silent x chromosome in the female epiblast stem cell family. so what you can do you can do the double scanning um, the of 4 and s3k27 um, so what you will get that the simultaneous presence of the phone and the absence of this s3k27 to distinguish the embryonic stem cells from the epiblast stem cells so that's how we distinguish between the embryonic stem cells and the epiblast stem cells. But now the million dollar question is if you are using a human blastocyst or a pre implantation stage embryo or the human pre implantation stage embryo, we isolate the stem cells, why we are ending up with epiblast stem cells? So people have given some reasons. So one of the appropriate reasons would be that in case of a human blastocyst, there is no dipos phenomenon. Because the dipose phenomena is very, very important. Like in case of a mouse, 
So this epiblast in case of the mouse persists in the naive state for only 24 hours in the mouse input. And you can immortalize them in vitreous embryonic structures. Because this state should persist, the epiblast cells persist in a naive state for only 24 hours in the mouse embryos. But we don't know about the humans actually. That in case of the human blastocyst, if you want to capture Acid glass stem cells, uh, the synchronic stem cells. Um, I would say nobody knows which window should be used to generate the synchronic stem cells. However, you can convert the human epiblast blast stem cells back into the synchronic stem cells or into the naive state by there just by overexpression on the K lepo. And you said all these things, then once you get the naive state, you cannot maintain the naive state forever. In case of the human epiblastomes, because we don't have those structural combinations to keep them in a naive state. That's a very important point. Now, with this pluripotent stem cells, now we know that what are the pluripotent stem cells, what are the IPS of induced pluripotent cells, what are the embryonic stem cells, what are the different methods by which you can generate the pluripotent stem cells, like one is uh, you can isolate the like stem cells or get the embryonic stem cells. In other cases, that you can induce the pluripotency in the somatic cells, and that's how you generate the induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, if you will go back to that um, slide where uh, we were discussing about the different categories of the stem cells on the basis of their potency. The first category was pluripotent cells, that means. Um, that uh, they can give rise to an entire organism on their own, right? And the second one was pluripotent stem cells, mean they can give rise to all types of cells, right? Um, but uh, but they cannot give rise to an entire organism on their own because they have to take the help of a perfected And the third category was the multipotent stem cells. It means they can give rise to many types of cells, but they cannot give rise to all types. And the uh, example was spot based stem cells, present gamma stem cells, imparting stem cells, uh, would easily fall into the category of multipotent stem cells. Now, cord blood stem cells. Uh, what I said that cord blood stem cells are uh, multipotent, you might have heard a lot about the cord blanking nowadays. So they are mushrooming up here and there in India, they must be like uh, 15 to 20 cord blood banks uh, as of now. So cord blood banking, what does it mean? Actually, you might have heard all these things on televisions, like different celebrities come on the television and they endorse uh, this cord blood banking. Some people say the best thing you can give to your kid is like a moment you can um, bank your cord blood um, in some banks. So there's a lot of hype on this cord blood banking even in India. So what does it mean and like how you can retrieve the cord blood stem cells? That's uh, what I'm going to tell you. So, first thing is that we all know what is the umbilical cord type. So, basically, what umbilical cord does, it's a rope like structure. So, it connects the baby with the mother. And like exchange of the gases, nutrition, everything takes place through this root like structure. So, if you will see it, it properly, the inner lining of this, this uh, root like structure has uh, is a connective tissue, and in the connective tissue, what you get, you get the present part structure. It means your inner line of the cord, like uh, this, this uh, umbilical cord, what it has, it's a reservoir of the mesenchymal structure. So it means the inner lining is a connective tissue, right? Like mesenchymal, meson means stroma, stroma means connective tissue. So the inner lining of the umbilical cord, if you will isolate what you will get, you will get the mesenchymal. So the, the one thing is that they are the reservoir of the mesenchymal. The second thing is then you can put the clamps on the both side of the umbilical cord and you can cut this cord and you can collect some blood cells, and then you can actually isolate the amateur system from these umbilical cords. So it means what? So it means they are the reservoir of the uh, camel stem cells, and the second one is uh, this uh, hemiparticus stem cells. 
people used to think that okay, this is uh, umbilical cord or this is placenta and this is uh, umbilical cord in the biological ways. Now people know the biological potential of this uh, umbilical cord because it has the potential to save millions of lives. How? If you can, if you can retrieve the endocardial stem cells and if you can freeze the connective tissue uh, from the umbilical cord, then you can be used later on. Like suppose um, a child develops some uh, medical issues after 15 or 20 years of his birth, his or her birth, then these cells can be used to, to address the problems, right? Because these cells will be coming from the patient itself. So uh, I guess you can designate it as the autologous cell therapy. You can use them for the autologous cell therapy. So what we have learned, we have learned two things like uh, Umbilical cord is like a rope like structure, and the inner lining of this rope like structure is a connective tissue. And this connective tissue is a reservoir of the mesenchymal stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells are very tricky actually because then we will go to the mesenchymal stem cells as well because many people believe that mesenchymal stem cells are not stem cells, they are just the fat cells. So we will get into those things after. But now you should remember that why there is so much hype about the Sumbhalpur cord because we believe that it's a reservoir of mesenchymal stem cells and the primitive body stem. So it used to be biological based. Now what people have started doing, they have started retrieving the this tissue and then the primitive body clear of stem cells and then they will put them in a liquid matter and um, I believe this is your bank, so they will charge some money for that thing as well. So if you will see here, if you what can get from this uh, umbilical cord, right? So it means you can get hematopoietic stem cells, hematopoietic resonator cells, uh, very small embryonic leg stem cells, and inferior colony forming cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and mixed residual cells. It means the reservoir of many types of cells, right? So if you can freeze these cells, it can be used later on for some therapies. Now, what is the big thing? If you will see that mesenchymal stem cells are very important cells in that way, because we believe, and, and, and it's already been established, that mesenchymal stem cells are or maybe immune privilege. When I say immune privilege, what does it mean? It means they have minimal or no HRI, HRI representation, that is a human metacyte and disease representation. It means you can use this mesen camel stem cells, maybe uh, for another patient as well, but you can use that to the um, patient itself and then it will be a long term cell therapy. Second thing is that uh, mesen camel stem cells have some immunomodulatory effects as well. As far as your metabolic sensors are concerned, they are multiple sensors, so they can give us the all types of blood cells. So we can isolate the immunopoietic sensors, we can try to differentiate the different type of cells we're looking for, and then it can be used by the patient. This simple concept, melting pot means the reservoir of the different kinds of multiple sensors, and it can be used for a therapy. So you can see if you are having a hematopoietic cell cells, you can generate all types of cells. The dendrocyte, dendrocyte, like white blood, RBCs, etc. by using a hematopoietic cell cell. So they are considered as a wonder source in the cord blood. So as far as the cord blood bank in India are concerned, then you will see uh, that there are different kind of um, or different banks are there in the different cities like Kolkata, Gurkama, Mumbai, Hyderabad, Bangalore. But I'm showing you with a disclaimer because I have downloaded it from the source, I've given the source as well. well. So I'm not sure how much they are asking, how many therapies being done. But these are the banks which are there in India. So you can do an again cross check whether these sources are reliable or not. But if you go with this, this uh, slide, I would say there are almost uh, 11, 12 kind of banks are there in India. They are charging this much amount of the money. And nowadays they come with a package as well. So some of them also got the DCGI 
completion is given drug control with the amount of failure activities of the RD secretion as well. So if you can isolate or you can bank or you can um, preserve these, these ordinary distances, then it can be used further for the baby if somehow down the line if it becomes some uh, regenerative disorder, regenerative disorder. So somebody is having a neural problem, so what you can do, you can use the muscle family students, you can remove the new muscles, and then that can help um, a baby to recover, or you can restore that if uh, this damage the lost new muscles. So maybe down the line somebody suffers from diabetes, so you can use, uh, you can go back to this band, they will thaw these cells, they will propagate the muscle family students, they will differentiate them into a cardiac cells, and then they will transplant back in the patient, and the patient is suffering from the myocardial infarction. So it's developing this technology is there, but we have to take it with a pinch of a salt because nobody knows when we will thaw it and use it for the patient's cells, how many cells which are right. Because when you freeze and thaw, you lose quite a few cells, right? So nobody knows exactly how many cells we survive. And second thing is cool apart number of cells you retrieve from the cord blood very less right and then you have to propagate them in your conditions and it's very 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 challenging to propagate the immunobiotic stem cells in in vitro conditions but you never know in coming years maybe five six years we might see some common astringent protocols which can be used to propagate these cells and then definitely these cells can be used to to address certain diseases or certain disorders which might which a uh, baby might get after uh, 10 or 20 years. So there is no harm in banking visas, but with less expectations. So if you will see the corporate banks in our overseas, like there are uh, many, many banks are there. Again, I would say I'm using a disclaimer uh, in this slide because I'm not sure. Number one, that uh, but you will see the source. So, uh, so we can see the name of these different banks are there. So, um, people are actually very much using this bank to get stored their their cord blood uh, cells. So, I guess if you have the money, uh, if you have the resources, and there is no harm in paying that much amount of money because, uh, as I said, it's like a work in the process. So people are trying to develop a stringent protocol. Uh, which can be used to propagate the new products and such new and new conditions, right? So, cord blood stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, and chronic stem cells. So, what we have done, there are different categories of stem cells are here. So, um, when you think about the IPSC or the induced pluripotent stem cells, um, you can make a clinical grade uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. But again, the problem will be like even if there's a, a single undifferentiated cell in the system, it can lead to a death of a man. So for that, you have to turn the first engine protocol to make sure that there should not be a single undifferentiated stem cell in your culture system because it will transfer back into the patient, it might lead to the death of a formation. This is very important. In chronic stem cell, as I said, that there are some ethical issues. You have yeah. getting the embryonic stem cells from a very some in vitro embryos. So the chances of immune infections are very, very high. And ethically it's wrong to uh, destroy an embryo for the uh, retrieval of the ICM cells. Because you want to capture embryonic stem cells, then you have to destroy the embryos. Right? So, <clears throat> but still the embryonic stem cells are very, very important. Why? For the research purposes. Because that's how you would be able to understand the pluripotency. Because pluripotency is a very complex subject. Now we know there are different stages of this, this pluripotency. One is a naive state, one is a prime state of pluripotency. When you isolate from the pre plant tissue stage in view, when you isolate the ICM source, you end up with the chronic symptoms. Uh, when you isolate these this cells from this post implantation stage in views, you end up with what? Hyperglass cells. So it means 
epigraph sensors are very much like uh, similar to the embryonic sensors, but they cannot find the boundaries. And that's the old standard of state versus the theory of state. There's the two differences, in the major difference between the epigraph and the embryonic sensors. Now, tomorrow, actually, what we will do, we will start with the missing campus computer because what I thought that what I taught you that uh, there's this umbilical cord the reservoir of the missing campus sensors and the limited particle sensors. So we need to discuss what are these missing campus sensors and what are the limited particle sensors. So I guess that's uh, from my side today. So again I will see you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you.